Really, we have a public-private surveillance partnership. Right? Fundamentally, both governments and corporations want this ubiquitous surveillance for their own reasons. A lot of data flows back and forth. And there are some breaks in this. I mean, you're seeing uh, corporations fight government a little bit around the edges, but very publicly, because it's, it's a good PR move. But largely, the interests are aligned. And it's power against us. And Google wants you very much to have privacy from everyone except them. Just like the FBI will say that. You want to, you, we want you to have privacy, just not from us. But you know, it doesn't actually work that way. So let's talk about why this matters. I mean, I think an audience like this, it's all obvious. But I want to enumerate some of the reasons. There are very profound implications for political liberty and justice. For people being accused by data and data being used as evidence. Again, you know, it's no big deal if it's uh, for advertising. You know, I get shown an ad for a Chevy I don't want to buy. You know, put it in a different context and someone drops a drone on my house. There's, there's an enormous amount of, of self-censorship in communities that are affected by this kind of surveillance. And this inhibits dissent, inhibits social change. It's ripe for abuse. There are matters of commercial fairness and, and, and equality that we are seeing surveillance-based discrimination, surveillance-based manipulation. We're seeing our data being exposed when the third parties that have it have privacy breaches. This matters for reasons of business competitive, competitiveness, that companies operating in countries with this kind of surveillance are being hurt in the market. We're seeing U.S. versus EU. Right? As EU has much more stringent privacy rules than the U.S. does, they be affecting U.S. companies. Right? This affects us for security. And the infrastructure of surveillance hurts our security. There's an article today that the U.S. Senate is for the first time allowing Signal to be used by Senate staffers. This is Signal. This is the program they called evil because people are using it to protect their privacy. They finally realize that, wait, wait, we need to protect our privacy. And, and because there are security implications for having all this surveillance data available to anybody. Anybody who can buy it, anybody who can steal it. And this, of course, affects privacy. I mean, fundamentally, deep down, it affects how we present ourselves to the world. It affects our, our autonomy as human beings. And by extension, ourselves, our liberty, our society. So, so how do we fix this? Now, I, I, I actually wrote a book on this called Data and Goliath. I spent a lot of time on how to fix this. The first one is to recognize that we need security and privacy. You often hear this discussed as a, as a, uh, as a trade off security versus privacy as if those under constant surveillance might feel more secure because of it. But I think we need both. Right? Privacy is a part of security. Security is a part of privacy. And more importantly, we need to prioritize security over surveillance, just like the US Senate just did. You know, we, uh, we live in an infrastructure which is highly computerized. Either we can build it for surveillance, which allows right, the FBI and the Russians to get at our data. We can build it for security and allow neither. Another principle is transparency. There's a lot of secrecy in this world. And one of the lessons I think we've learned uh, you know, post Snowden is that secret laws have failed. That the secrecy means there's no robust debate in our society about this, either on the government side or on the corporate side. We need more corporate transparency as well. I assume people, would, if you're interested, just look at the really impressive series of investigative reports New York Times published on Uber and the things they're doing with our data. Now, it's pretty scary. I mean, it's things that are online with some of those NSA programs I talked about. They were able, using the Uber data they had, was to identify regulators because they would tend to hail Ubers near government buildings. And they would show them a different, more legal version of Uber that us normal customers wouldn't see. 
They actually had a name for the program that was, that was surprisingly benign. So transparency, but that's not enough. You need oversight and accountability. Right? Some methods to, to deal with these issues. There's an important principle which I call uh, one world, one network, one answer. That we simply, we, that we just don't know how to build a world where some people can spy and some people can't. Right? The FBI very much wants into your iPhone. Not all the time, just in case you, they think you're doing something. But they'll say, you know, we don't want a back door. We just want an ability to get in that only we can use and someone else can't. But I don't know how to do that. I can't build an access mechanism into this device that only operates when there's a legal warrant sitting next to it. Right? I can't make a technical capability function differently in the presence of a legal document. And either I make this secure or I make this not secure. Then I've got to build some kind of social system to try to hope that only the FBI uses it and the Russians or the criminals don't. But I don't want to do that. So it's either security for everyone or security for no one. So the solutions here are, are, are very complicated. I mean, they're politically legal, political, legal, technical. You know, we're living in a world where because we always knew that technology can subvert law, but we also learned that law can subvert technology. And we need both working together. And we don't have time for concrete proposals. It's put a bunch in my book. But really, social change needs to happen first. Right? None of this will change until, one, we get over fear, and two, we value privacy. This is hard. I mean, there's, there's lots of studies that show that we value privacy greatly, but it comes down to the point of purchase. I mean, we gladly give up our privacy for one ten thousandth of a free trip to Hawaii. I mean, this has to be a political issue. It was not in the last US election. I doubt it is in the current British election. I haven't been paying that much attention. But there's a real fundamental quandary here. And that is, how do we design systems that benefit society as a whole while at the same time protecting people individually? And I actually think this is the fundamental issue of the information age. Our data together has enormous value to us collectively. Our data apart has enormous value to us individually. It is data in the group interest versus data in the individual interests. It is the social benefit of big data versus the individual risks of personal data. I started by, by saying that data is a, a byproduct of the information age. Go one step further. I think data is the pollution problem of the information age. I found it interesting saying that here at you know, a center built by Carnegie. Right? You think about it, all processes produce it. It stays around. It's festering. How we deal with it how we reuse it, recycle it, who has access to it, how we dispose of it, what laws regulate it. That's central to how the information age functions. And I truly believe that just as we here today look back at those early decades of the industrial age and marvel uh, on how the titans of that age could ignore pollution in their rush to build the industrial age, that our grandchildren will look back at us here today in the early decades of the information age. And they're going to judge us on how we dealt with data and the problems resulting from that.